If you have a technology problem in an institute like this, it's very easy to see who should solve a technology problem. You put technicians to work on the problem. If you have a management problem or an administrative problem, you put managers to work on the problem. But if you have a social problem, who should work on it? And this is the question that I want us to explore. My answer to that question is that a social problem should be worked on by all of society. Now that may seem like a non-answer. How can all of society work on something? And what I'm going to talk to you about is how that's possible. Um, oops. This is actually not the slide I sent you, but we'll go with this. Um, we're going through rapid urbanization uh, in most of our cities. We've got you know, 200,000 people that move into cities like Bangalore every, every year. And this puts phenomenal pressure on the city. Um, you have a central government, which is very far away, and most people don't know what the central government does. The state government is less far away if you live in a state capital like Bangalore. Um, not many people know what the state government does either. Um, and then you have the municipality. Most people live in a city that has a municipality. Most people know what the municipality does, but they're not very happy about it. Um, so they wish the municipality did not do some of the things that it does. Um, and then there are departmental silos. It's you know each department works for its on its own timetable on its own. Its timetables are almost like they're designed to create chaos. One guy will come and lay the road. Next guy will come and dig the road. It's like you know a very predictable timetable. Um, and then there are guys like me and sometimes guys like you sitting in academic establishments and saying, well, I know how to solve this problem. I wish somebody else would go and solve the problem. We only write about how to solve the problem. Um, but that's not going to work either. So how do you figure out what works and how do you scale it? That's what I'm going to talk about. Um, this is something that I built some years ago. It's called the Bangalore Transport Information System. Now, the first thing I want you to know before I talk about the system itself is that by training, I'm an astronomer and a cloud physicist. I don't know anything about any of these things. And that means I'm perfectly qualified to solve these problems, just like you are. Um, what we did is that we pulled multiple sources of data together. I run a small lab called MapUnity. It's a social pro public problem solving lab. We pulled multiple sources of data together. We got telecom towers together and figured out how to create density maps of the city by watching how people move around in the city. You don't actually have to watch individuals. If you watch how the towers are behaving, you can actually track teledensity. Uh, we tracked GPS units on BMTC buses to figure out how fast the buses were moving, and that gives you another indication of congestion. Uh, the police have about 200 cameras in the city, and if you convert those camera images into density and by looking at how many objects are visible in each camera image, that gives you a third source of information. And we put all of this stuff together into something called the Bangalore Transport Information System. And there's also other stuff you can figure out using this system. If you your vehicle has any fines that are outstanding, and if you are like me, you probably have many fines outstanding. Um, and then if you're buying a vehicle from somebody else, you can figure out whether the guy who's selling the vehicle to you is actually the owner of the vehicle, uh, which is sometimes useful. After you've paid for it, you don't want the cops to come and take it away saying it's a stolen vehicle. Um, so things like that. What is, the, what is the nice thing about this? It's an independently put together system. It actually doesn't require anyone to do it. It's not my job to do it, but I can also do it. There's a certain technology platform that I can build. I can build a web GIS platform. I can build an MIS layer on top of it. I can organize the information. I can build an SMPP gateway that communicates all of this to people in, into public. And most importantly, it breaks this asymmetry of information. The system that you use to figure out what traffic is like should also be the system that the police use to actually manage traffic. That's what you really want. Then we built this. This is India's first traffic management system, uh, management center. This is in Ashok Nagar police station near Garuda Mall. The nice thing about this image, and, and this is something that I'm extremely proud of, the nice thing about this image is that every person that you see on the screen here is a police constable. This is a center run by the police. It's not an outsourced center. The technologies here have been pulled together through intellectual capital from people like you and me. People saying that I know how to write software, what hardware needs to be brought, how it needs to be stitched together. On a voluntary basis, lots of people working together to build the technical environment in which the police function. And then the police themselves run the center. Um, they made some 40, 50 crores by challenging people in the last year or so, which is like a huge improvement. Three years ago or four years ago, before we had this digital traffic control center, the challenging system used to work like this. The cops would write down the challenge on a piece of paper. They would go back to their local police station. 
and they would try to enter the data onto a local machine and if the data entry was correct, if there's no virus in that computer, if there is electricity and all of those things worked properly, then the Chalan would get transmitted to the Chalan server and if the Chalan server knew which address the person actually lived at who owned that vehicle, they would send the Chalan to that person and if that person felt like paying the fine, he would pay it. <laughs> and at the end of that process, there was a 2% compliance rate. Today, there's a 70% compliance rate. The police are also moving towards a system that is much more evidence-based. It's not accusation-based, where the police say that you've done something wrong, there's actual evidence of it. You've seen them walking around with Blackberries and phones and all of those things in the city. Those phones were actually donated by people like you and me. Those, many, of the, many of those camera phones or the cameras that they use to take pictures in the non-junction areas, those were donated by private people to say, well, enforce the traffic in many other parts of the city too, not only in the junction areas. And then as we started to do this technology work, one remarkable thing happened. Other people started to come to us and say, well, why can't we all work on larger and larger problems together? And that is the thing that I want to talk to you about. But fundamentally, you have to ask the question, in a democracy, are you a producer of democracy or are you a consumer of democracy? And this is an important question. Too often we want to consume the right things from democracy. We wish our politics was giving us some good things that we would really like to consume. But who is going to have to produce them? And I'm saying that the answer to that question is that each of us needs to become a producer of democracy more than a consumer. And it's possible. BMTC came to me and said, well, you almost invariably don't help us. You've been helping only the traffic police. Why can't some of you guys work with us to improve BMTC's bus operations? So we took that up as a challenge. Many of you have seen the Big Ten bus all over the city. It's an extremely successful and extremely popular bus service in the city. For the first time, we have direction-oriented bus service in the city. The Big Ten bus comes from outside the city to the city center on all the major roads. Initially, we used to run them on 10 major roads in the city. And that's why it's called the Big Ten bus. Now it actually runs on 12 such roads, but because the service is so popular, we've not been able to change the name. We've kept the name Big Ten, but we run it on 12 routes. Um, the nice thing about it is that it's a predictable, reliable system, and uh, you can sort of begin to eliminate your waiting times if you make high frequency services on arterial roads. That's what we're trying to do. On Hosur Road, the bus will come every 45 to 90 seconds, and we're trying to see whether we can build a system in which arterial road bus service will come 45 seconds or more frequently on every one of these arterial roads. They use the bus during the IPL games. At the end of the game from the game, you can go to any part of the city on this bus. And it's also got some creative elements. If you look, many of you know Canada. If you look at the design, the Big Ten is written in a way that it reads Big Ten, whether you read it in English or in Canada. It actually won some design awards too. My friends in the design community created the actual cladding and design of the bus. So what it tells you is that the problem solving is a continuum. It's not merely a technology problem. It's not an optimization problem also. It's a communication problem. It's, a, it's an exercise in bringing together many people who feel connected to the solution. Um, and this is necessary. I want to tell you a little joke about this thing. In BMTC on the very first day, I asked a few people, I'm going to give you some bus numbers and you guys need to tell me what the number of this bus is. So randomly I tried some numbers, 147K, 126Q, sometimes numbers that I knew myself probably did not exist. And what I discovered was that it was not so bad that you and I don't know what buses exist and which ones don't exist. The truth is that many people in BMTC also don't know which buses exist and which ones don't exist. And there's a reason for that. The numbers don't mean anything. The numbers don't mean anything. When you say 126C, neither 126 nor C means anything in their numbering system. So we're trying to create a numbered system, 1, 2, 3, 4. You know, the bus that runs on Kanakpura Road is 5, the bus that runs on Banargata Road is 4, and so on. There's a nice predictable uh, and uh, clockwise order to the numbering. And we're saying if that Kanakpura Road is number 5, the bus that connects Hulima Village to Kanakpura Road should be called Hulima 5. The bus that connects the airport to Kanakpura Road should be called Airport 5, and so on and so forth. If you go through this rationalization, you'll come up with a numbering system where the buses are identifiable by design and the numbers actually mean something. Thing. And this is an exercise that people like you and me can be part of. Um, oops, what did I do? There's things in the city. We started improving junctions in the city. There are lots of urban designers and architects who have participated in this exercise to say, well, one of the problems in the junctions is that the, you know, turning movements need to be separated, and people have been working with the municipality to do some of this stuff. We built a model footpath. This is in Kundalahalli, from Kundalahalli Junction to Varthur Kodi. For 14 kilometers, we built, built this footpath. It's two and a half meters wide at all points. It's continuously walkable. There's no up and down. 
Um, it's, it's like many other. <laughs> and, and most critically, it's built with BBMP money, with BBMP contracting, and BBMP procedures. What it tells you is that it's extremely possible to build a world class footpath. What it requires to make this happen all over the city is participation by more of us in making these things happen in every part of the city. And then when there was an interesting thing, once uh, three years ago in the municipal council, if you've never been to a municipal council meeting, I strongly encourage you to do that. It's a lot of free entertainment. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, one of the things that we tried some three or four years ago is to try to figure out uh, what is the... Uh, how roads and footpaths get built and what we realize is that every time there is a cost overrun in building a road the footpath will get left off so we tried to create and I successfully created a separate footpath budget which allows the footpaths to be taken up on them on their own merit so that there's no cost overrun by which the footpaths get eliminated uh, there were some fun things that happened with that also but you know it's been going on reasonably successfully now metro has also started building in the city and many of you have been victims of metro's constructions in these areas also and uh, but Metro has done one good thing. They've accepted responsibility for maintaining the footpaths around the metro stations, which will make it easier for people to walk up to the uh, metro station and use the metro that much more uh, reliably. <coughs> we did some space design of key junctions. This is War Memorial Junction at the bottom of Brigade Road. How you can redesign. This is again another group of urban architects and planners trying to say if you redesign some of these junctions, you'll get great public spaces in which people can feel safe, comfortable, clean all of those things that you expect in public spaces around the world. We're doing some uh, access improvement uh, plans for each of the stations. Um, this is the number cycle, cycle sharing program at IASC, which we started about seven or eight months ago. This is an inside the campus cycle sharing program that says if you want to, IASC has got a very large campus, some 300 odd acres, and to get around inside the campus, what you'd like is some sort of facility like this, which doesn't require you to buy your own cycle, but you can just rent this thing. And um, we're seeing steady improvement in numbers of these things. Now we're trying to see how more people who live around IASC campus can also use this. There are also guys in this side of town, Kalyani Tech Park, wants to have a program, I am meant like to have a program. Can we create more centers where these things actually work together? You've seen this, this is Vital Malia Road, right? Now, this is a reasonably nice road. Look at, look at the edge of the road. It's walkable, drivable to the edge of the road. The footpath is completely walkable. This was built in Bangalore. If one road could be like this, why can't every other road be like this? This is what you would like every road to be. And there's a reason why this road is like this. For, for one, one of those reasons is that in this case, the local business community came forward to the municipality and said, we will build the infrastructure in this neighborhood ourselves at our, at our cost. Give us the specifications and leave the job to us. And that's how this road was built. And now we're trying to say that the municipality should adopt this approach to a lot more places. Whoever wants to build infrastructure at their cost, according to design standards that are set by the municipality, should be able to do this. And if you, if you did this, uh, you would actually see many more such infrastructure come up all over the city. Uh, this is the commuter rail program. It's very interesting because a bunch of private citizens proposed how to connect Bangalore to surrounding towns uh, which are 30, 40 kilometers away from the city. And what it tells you is that it's possible for you to be a private citizen and still propose ideas and problem solving for mobility from the outside in a way that is received in government, considered in government, and even uh, decisions are taken on those. So what we now have is a culture of public input and problem solving in mobility. So one of the things that I I'm asking now is to say, can I repeat it? So this thing, on, this is a picture of Putanahali Lake before and after we got involved in cleaning it. When I, I, my house is very close to Putanahali Lake. When I moved into it, it was like this on the left. A few years later, we sort of brought it out to this stage. And all we did differently was get the local community involved in the maintenance of the lake. But we didn't just do it in an informal way. We went to the municipality and we actually got a formal agreement with the municipality that the local community would take care of the lakes. And as a result of this, now many more lakes are being revived with community support. We have a Bangalore lakes project which looks at 183 different lakes in the city and has uh, uh, documentation and revival exercise for each one of those. Uh, we have a program called One Bengaluru which is a kind of a joint initiative for public problem solving and they have a huge lakes team that does all these things together. 
and uh, there's, a, there's a portal that I'm building, it's called B-City, uh, the Bangalore Governance Observatory. Just like we brought all the mobility information into a single public portal called Traffic Information System, we're bringing all the governance information, health, sanitation, education, BWSSB, BESCOM, all sorts of things together into a single platform, which will present all of the governance issues in the city on a single uh, presentation. Take a look at it, you'll find many things that you can actually engage with. And then we've been having trouble with water supply all over the city. Th until 1975, there was no problem with pipe water supply. The city actually lived on rainwater and groundwater. Even today, Bangalore gets more water than the water that is piped into the city by Kaveri. You get more rainfall than Kaveri supply in Bangalore. So what we don't have is a comprehensive system of tapping into it. And we don't have a system of reviving the lakes. So what some of us have been working on is trying to revive the lakes as storage reservoirs for uh, rainwater and try to figure out how this rainwater can be used for local supply. So you don't have to supply water from the Kaveri 110 kilometers away at 35 rupees a kiloliter if you can do it from a nearby lake uh, for the local community itself. It will reduce the pressure and the cost. And you can also do one other thing which is connecting the dots. What you can do is to say, well on the one side I worked on mobility, on another side I worked on uh, reviving the lakes. Now if I put a bicycle stand like this at each of the lakes, the, the story begins to connect. It's part of lake revival, it's also part of um, mobility infrastructure. And what we're finding is that you know, we're, now we're actually going around to telling some companies, don't just do your CSR in an uninformed way, do your CSR in a way that actually uh, helps the city get outcomes like this. And many companies are actually interested in this kind of participation in public problem solving. So the public approach to problem solving is repeatable across topics. That is, many of us simply by choosing to be part of the solution can actually produce solutions. There's no reason why we can't go on building social systems like this. I only talk to you about uh, mobility and about lake revival. We've done this kind of work with waste management, the segregation work that's going on all over the cities, really the work of solid waste management round table and many communities that pushed for segregation. I myself walked one day from Mandur to Domlur just to figure out what are all the things that are wrong in the system and how to get more people involved in it. The more important thing that we are realizing now is that as we keep building these solutions, we can also make these solutions connect to each other. And if we do this in domain after domain, in geography after geography, each of us in our hearts, in our respective communities, out of uh, an idea that we can build a better society together, you can actually make all these ideas connect together and accelerate the process of development. They used to tell you in 1947 that India is a developing country. So for every decade since then you've been told that India is a developing country. When is it actually going to become a developed country? And the answer to that question is when you and I decide to be a part of democracy, when you and I decide to become producers of the kinds of outcomes that we want in public life, that's when you're going to get a developed country. Thank you very much.